All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined all the way over on the other coast in Cape Cod in, the, in Massachusetts by Kyle Hoffman. How are you doing, Kyle? I'm doing great. Thank you, John. Yeah, and Kai is an executive at uh, Zeno PSI Ventures, sits on the leadership team for two portfolio companies, Function Growth and Wello, runs the, st the strategy department at Function Growth and operates as the chief marketing officer for Wello. Function Growth and Zenopsy Ventures specialize in using behavioral science to drive growth for their clients and is a unique uh, substantiation to the tactics that Function Growth uses to scale brands. So what we're going to talk today about is DTC and e-commerce, how to grow brands through digital in the post iOS 14 era. So maybe start off, Kyle, for the uninitiated and just uh, explain what you mean by DTC and e-commerce. Yeah, of course. Um, so DTC refers to direct to consumer, of course. Mm -hmm. um, direct to consumer businesses that that we like to focus on at Function Growth uh, are typically e-commerce businesses are, are the businesses that we're working with. So mm -hmm. um, really what's kind of different, I guess, about D2C businesses and when, once you start to sell in wholesale and retail and, and third party retail channels uh, is you're building that relationship directly with with customers. Uh, so a lot more goes into the brand building and the customer mm -hmm. relationship and uh, curating customer journeys and that sort of thing. But uh, we refer to D2C kind of as, yeah. as e-commerce businesses. Yeah. So, uh, so obviously it's a, it, you know, a direct to consumer is quite a challenge today because there's so much noise in the market. There's so many platforms, there's so many different ways people receive information. Uh, so how do you, when you, I mean, cause obviously the, the growth you achieved as well, is like quite ph phenomenal, but so how do you as, as a brand, like figure out where your customers are and where's the best way to, to get to them rather than kind of, ch you know, chase all the shiny objects yeah it's um it requires a lot of uh trial and error i would say <laughs> mm -hmm. um but we uh and it's probably helpful i'll, I'll uh, tell the story of of how we started wello because i yeah. think that illustrates the way that we that we thought about um that we thought about it so if you rewind to 2020 uh xenosci is just one single company we have three different uh, distinct departments in the company. Mm -hmm. uh, one is an ad agency, more of a traditional ad agency, traditional in the sense that they're working with big brands um, and they're doing uh, longer term campaigns, you know, year long creative campaigns, mm -hmm. um, million dollar budgets to, to develop one video that's going to be on TV and go on the Super Bowl. Uh, we had a politics uh, department, which is focused on political marketing, political clients. And then we had a D2C growth accelerator, uh, which was focused on businesses between five to, uh, we'll say 60 million or so. Uh, mm -hmm. So kind of smaller businesses, some some that scaled up um, and, and just helping those, those businesses grow. All three obviously require much different expertise to, yeah. to, 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 to have an impact. Um, and so uh, in 2020, the growth accelerator was really seen a lot of success with some of their partners, more than a typical performance agency would. Um, and uh, and uh, Michael Aaron, who's our uh, president of Xenosci at the time, uh, currently and also at the time, uh, had the realization, you know, why not? Why don't we start our own brand so that we can get in on on selling products to consumers, diversify our business, all sorts of great reasons. Um, and um, and while we're at it, we should probably split all these different companies into three distinct companies right, right. Uh, because they're so different. So um, that was right around the time that I got connected with Michael Aaron. He was busy running Xenosci. It was kind of a lot going on, obviously, to start an entire new D2C business. So I was brought in to run strategy at um, the growth accelerator, which we call Function Growth now. It's now launched in its, its own company. Um, and then also helped to launch the D2C brand Wello. Um, one of the ways it's been it's been really helpful for us to launch Wello has been the fact that we have this shared services model. So Wello technically only has two or three people working full time, mm -hmm. but gets 30, uh, 30 people 
snapped in from function growth who are right. working and on the brand um and so launching a new brand that was hugely impactful we had tons of people um who were contributing their time and their resources to make it happen uh so we launched in october 2021 and uh kind of just hoping to, to find a proof of concept to see if mm -hmm. we could actually run a DTC business as an agency, uh, see if we could make a dent in the compression socks market. And, right. um, and we did, we, uh, we have, you know, 175,000 customers now, and, uh, we're working to substantiate this claim, but we're pretty sure that we're the fastest growing compression sock company in the U S if not the fastest growing sock company. But, right. um, but to your question, you asked how, uh, in the post iOS era, which is, you know, October, 2021 is peak iOS 14. Um, we made the decision to sell 100% D to C through our own website, which was, mm -hmm. um, I guess, debatable. if that was a good decision or not, but right. uh, it's worked out for us. Uh, so we, we were, uh, did almost all of our customer acquisition through Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have a creative led approach. I, I would say the biggest driver for us has been honing in and focusing super heavily on creative. Mm -hmm. What happened with iOS 14 is we lost a lot of that, that data and that, that ability to target um, consumers. And so, uh, so we've had to lead with our creative and we've been, we've, we put out 20 plus ads a week wow. um, at this point. So quantity quality uh it, it all goes into it but it's it's really mm. been the creative that's driven a lot of our success yeah so what so there's a couple of interesting things there number one is you know you may obviously you made the strategic decision to have your own website and decide to sell through that obviously mm -hmm. there's other options you know people have but that was the first strategic decision the second one as you said was obviously to lead with the creative and to choose you know facebook and instagram as the platform uh to find your right audience because i think that's an important thing because i think that's what paralyzes people sometimes is that they think especially when they're starting they think it's best to just try and be everywhere and obviously you can't be and mm -hmm. that's probably not where your, your customers aren't everywhere but also you can bleed you can bleed your capital very quickly doing that but also focus and i think that's the most important thing you bleed focus mm -hmm. yeah people like to um to uh to write off facebook and instagram a lot these days but it, i mean it's just hard to ignore it's it's uh your customer is you know if you're running a business in america your customer is most likely on facebook and instagram and mm -hmm. Granted, you're a lot more reliant on uh, the Facebook algorithm these days to reach those people, right. whereas you used to be able to pick them in your targeting. But um, but th that's the whole idea with the creative-led approach, right? If you if you develop creative that you know communicates to to the customer that you're trying to communicate to. Facebook does a pretty pretty good job of reaching those people. Mm -hmm. And then from um, and then from the point of view of what, what did you do to? I mean, you said okay, you you think you're probably the number one now in the compression sock, maybe even in the sock, or it's fast growing, uh, fastest growing. Uh, but what when you came into that market, what did you? What was it that you saw the opportunity to maybe do things a little differently, or maybe attracted or attract people differently? Because I mean, when you say compression socks, right? Um, I don't know how I, I don't know how I would go about marketing that. That's why I'm fascinated to know how you would do, how you differentiate it. <laughs> yeah, it's um, uh, it's really interesting. We we um, so like you mentioned, we we're big on behavioral science here. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of treat behavioral science as essentially another input to to decision making. Right. Um, you know, you you have uh, you can go out and do market research. You can gather first party data, you can gather third party data, all of those eventually just help you make an educated decision and behavioral science is no different. There's scientific studies on how consumers interact and in, in certain situations and you have to be able to use those to your advantage. Um, and, uh, and so we used a lot, uh, we weren't starting from ground zero when we launched the compression mm -hmm. socks brand. Granted, a lot of the stuff that we thought would work uh, didn't, but uh, I'll get to that. But um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so we, we built the foundations of the brand based on the fact that we thought that we, currently compression socks are mostly used by people who need compression socks. Right. Um, there's a lot of uh, medical issues or medical reasons that 
that require compression socks. Uh, pregnancy is a great use case for compression socks, travel, but it's mm -hmm. all very much people who, who have a specific use case. And our our idea for the brand was well, you know, compression socks are great, but they're they're great for for people who need them, but they're also great for people who might not even know that they they want them or that they could use them and that they would provide a health benefit. So our idea was to launch this brand as um, uh, as, as more of a lifestyle brand uh, with more fun colors that would appeal to to more people that would differentiate it as another thing you wanted to buy compression socks previously, it was basically black, white, gray, and, and, uh, and neutral colors. And uh -huh. you didn't have, there wasn't a lot of personality that came with it. And so we were really focused on building this lifestyle brand that was, that was differentiated. That's one of the be key behavioral science principles that we're, we're always focused on. Um, some, you know, a lot of people know it's, I think it's obvious to know that you need to differentiate your brand. But um, what a lot of people don't really realize is that it's actually more important to just have a different brand and a distinct brand than it is to have like a brand that looks cool or aesthetically pleasing. Pleasing. Uh, Liquid Metal is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but anyway, so you know, we 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 weren't starting from ground zero. We used a lot of this. What we learned actually when we launched uh, is that. Uh, our core audience for the first year that we were in business still was the, the right. people who yeah. need compression socks. Mm -hmm. And that's, so what's really interesting about that as well is that, uh, is you're expanding it outside of people who need it. I mean, that's a really interesting point because I mean, taking a look at a market like that and sort of going, Oh, hang on a second. There could be a, an opportunity for it, you know, to sell to adjacent and to expand it. Um, and so tell me about in your early days when you thought, okay, your first year or so you were getting all the compression socks people. How did you start to attract in those people who are uh, adjacent to them? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's happened, uh, sort of naturally. Um, we, so we, we, our, our core demographic was, you know, 60 plus, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of older people are people who use compression socks. Um, and, and a lot of our advertising, even since the time we launched, uh, showed younger people, people in their, in their thirties, and, and there's certainly an aspirational effect to it. So, uh, so even, even though we're showing a lot of these younger people, it still is interesting and attractive and makes older people want to buy. But, um, but we've started to, uh, in fact, launch some new collections that we think are more appealing to um, to younger audiences. So we just launched a Stripe collection in fall, for example, that, uh, that funny enough, it was called the Retro Stripe collection, mm -hmm. but it was more appealing to a younger audience. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that says about people these days, but <laughs> <laughs> young people that, these days. That's but, but yeah, we're we're expanding the um, the collections and um, and then the other big piece of it is that we're talking about the um, the the product differently. So we come up with uh, new what we call messaging canvases uh, that are basically messaging guidelines. And uh, every season we come out with a new one. So we come out with four different messaging canvases a year. And um, and this spring messaging canvas, since we really started to to kind of accelerate and and, and uh, get more market saturation, we now are are changing the way that we're talking about the socks to be more appealing from a lifestyle perspective. Mm -hmm. A lot of the creative that we did in the early days was, uh, you know, foot swelling. It was a lot of use case uh, related right. yeah. um, verbiage, and so you know, you, feet swelling. Uh, you know, better for circulation, et cetera. Now we're talking, we're doing a lot more UGC, uh, a lot more, you know, uh, that thing that I, I never knew that I needed uh, right. type of videos. Um, and so that's been really impactful for expanding our market. And to be honest, uh, there still is a whole giant untapped section of that core demographic that we're, that we're still uh, working right. on. But um yeah, compression sock market ended up being a lot bigger than we thought it would be. <laughs> and let me just ask you a, a quick question. So, about when your your original, um, say, audience, as you said, the 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 compression sock users had had traditionally been serviced, as you said, with black, white, and gray, or whatever these boring mm -hmm. socks, and they looked like compression socks, and you know, 
obviously that's why they were pretty unattractive to anybody else. Yeah. Of that core market, when you started producing different types and colors, how much of that market started to migrate to, do you think, offhand, uh, off the top of your head, migrated to actually flashier, colorful, you know, like moved beyond the traditional? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And we just did a, um, a, a survey of our customers to see what kind of other compression socks they were buying or and what they had bought after buying us. And a, a lot of consumers, uh, I think it was around 25% uh, of people had bought compression socks on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people are buying them on Amazon and a lot of people were buying them in retail stores, big department stores. Um, and uh, w w a good statistic for us was that when once people had bought ours, they had a lot of them had not gone back to buy other socks, mm -hmm. which was good. Um, but yeah, and it's um, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been an, an, an interesting um, interesting to see how people have 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 changed their buying habits. One of the big things with our socks that was different was we the the products themselves are a lot more comfortable and breathable actually uh -huh. um which was one of the big pain points a lot of the existing com com compression socks on the market were pretty heavy so wearing them mm -hmm. in the summer when a lot of people need to wear them is is obviously not great but mm -hmm. um, um yeah so so part of this then was uh i i mean let's face it i mean compression socks I wouldn't say it's not not the biggest deal in the world, but probably most people weren't really want to draw attention to the fact that they're wearing them or whatever, you know, particularly as it's, you know, health related. So I guess in some ways you're changing the attitude to them as well as, you know, just expanding the market, but you're changing, you have to change the underlying maybe biases people have. Yeah, exactly. Um lots of underlying biases there's a lot of underlying biases that compression socks are uncomfortable and mm -hmm. uh, i don't want to wear them for a long time but i have to wear them so not something that people were proud of uh of showing off for any mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. uh and they're still kind of hard to show off uh <laughs> because they're, they're knee-high socks but, <laughs> but they certainly look a lot better when they're colorful that's for sure um and one of the interesting things too i, I mean you talked about the black and white yeah, yeah. and the neutral being really all that existed before. Um, one of the things that we've found on our website, we still sell by far the most sure. black. black is by far the most color that we sell. White is I think next and then maybe gray. But what we found is if we don't have colorful socks available on the website, if we're sold out of a lot of the colorful socks, people don't buy as much. So it's almost, mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a lot of people who are buying colorful socks as like the one extra pair that they'll throw in their cart, um, mm -hmm. in addition to the two black that they bought for that uh, special occasion. Yeah, exactly <laughs> for the, when they're uh, for for the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, in the last few moments, Kyle, and um, what was the thing that maybe surprised you most? Because when you go through a journey like that, I mean, there's obviously you know you you're surprised pleasantly or whatever by something. But what was what was the most surprising thing? to you that's a good question um you know i think the most surprising thing to me um has been how important it is for uh for customer experience uh and we really didn't get a chance to talk about that too much but we we kind of knew ahead of time we have to have our customer service has to be really buttoned up we have to make sure that we're delivering a good experience to customers um, and you just can't underestimate how how important it is, even for us, like we we grew really fast and we couldn't keep up with a lot of the customer service requests that we were getting. Uh, and we're still kind of trying to recover from some of that old uh, unresponsiveness right. and things like that. Or people still love our products and we're doing a good job making our products. But um, but just being responsive and, and really engaging with consumers is so so important yeah i I, th I think that's such a critical point and not just for you know for for direct to consumer b2c businesses but obviously b2b businesses as well i mean we've become so attuned i think as consumers that any slight break in that supply chain or in that customer experience any slight fall we default to that as the overall experience because we're humans yeah mm -hmm. um, and therefore <laughs> um getting that customer experience right is 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 so critical because people just swap and change so quickly these days yeah it's very um, true yeah. yeah 
Well, listen, Kyle, this has been great. All of Kyle's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah. Um, well, we we, uh, we work with other brands, too. We don't just start our own. So if uh, you have a, a D2C business um, that's that's in that five to you know twenty five million dollar range and you're looking to uh, grow, you can go to functiongrowth.co. Uh, and you'll find a, a form there to reach out to us and um, you'll get a hold of me through that form. So, <laughs> so I'll be the one getting in touch. Excellent. Well, let's not encourage you. The, the success speaks for itself. Congratulations, Kyle. It's phenomenal. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, sharing your insights today. Thank you for watching, listening, and I'll see you all again soon.